factor, how can you prove it? The evidence. Um, you, it's very with remote viewing. It's very hard to, uh, or I would say, impossible to work on on your own. Really. Like for example, there's loads of targets that I would love to do, um, but I don't feel that it would be right for me to put them in a a, a pool of targets for myself because I don't think it'd be buying enough. It's it's very hard to work a target in remote viewing, you know, uh, if you know something about it or, or if you've got a very small pool of targets of, you know, anything up to a hundred, I would say. So it's, yeah, I would find it very, I would, I would find it very hard or impossible. You know, it, the best way is to find a group of people or someone that would, would partner with you and set you targets. So how would you go about uh, viewing something like, um, Somewhere where you've never been, and then proving it. Um, I mean, you see it, these targets that we, if you do it with somebody in a monitor. Yes. Somebody, but somebody. Well, I've only just been on one course, to be honest okay. with you. Yeah. Um, I usually use my own psychic abilities, but um, how can you prove it if? You see, I think you can pick up if you're using a monitor who knows the destination, you can pick up intuitively or psychically from them what the target is. So, how can you prove evidence? You know, how I just find it very strange. Um, do you mean, uh, when you say monitor, do you mean the person that sets you the target or do you mean that someone yeah. that might be with you when you're doing it? No, the, uh, the someone that sets you the target because yeah. you know, our psychic energies can reach, mo you know. That is, uh, I just, I just wrote, wrote a second article uh, and published it this week on my website about that very, uh, very question. Um, how yeah. do we know that we're not picking up um, what the person that sets the target wants us to say rather than picking up information from the actual real target itself yeah um and yeah. to be honest the only good the good way to know is to only do or try to only work targets that have really really solid uh accurate feedback for example you know if if the target were is, is the eiffel tower really boring simple target you know that's set in time and space you know we've all seen video film and pictures and you know there's wikipedia pages and everything about how that was constructed so we have enough feedback evidence to be able to prove that anything i give as a remote viewer is most probably accurate information but on something like you know if, if the target is i don't know a jellyfish life form that's floating above the earth uh, you know that's what the that's what the target set for me and i come out with information because we have no video no documented evidence to support that you can't you can't guess you can't tell the accuracy you can't tell whether it's fiction or not so it just has to remain unknown until maybe at one point in the future that you have enough information that you could verify and say okay this was a proper remote viewing you know target it happened now because we can now verify from the feedback that has just now emerged that that information was accurate so it all comes down to feedback really yeah so that's what was why i was wondering where do you get the feedback from how can you can be working on a target maybe for months on end or years even, yeah. but you you may never really know whether you've been accurate or not. Yes, I've I've got targets in my pool that I've done for uh, clients and for for people. They're so um, non feedbackable at this stage. Uh, I, I've been waiting over over a decade for feedback information. So at this time, I can all I can say is. And this is where it come, where it's good to database your accuracy and stuff. All I can say on a target like that is, you know, my my average accuracy score on all targets is well over eighty percent, eighty percent of the time. So you you know you just have to take that because in in lieu of not having any feedback, you just have to take that as as a possibility that I'll probably be accurate on this as well, and eighty percent of what I say is going to be accurate. Um, 
but you can't de de definitively say anything, you know, because e every remote viewer has a bad day and, and goes off target now and again. Um, so that, that's only to be used as like a little bit of a, a guideline principle. The, the real thing is feedback. It just has to remain unknown until you get feedback. And as I said, patience then, patience. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, yeah. And the, that, the problem is everyone out there wants to rush and use remote viewing on esoteric targets because, you know, I guess everyone finds esoteric targets, you know, the spice of life and it's interesting. But on its own, remote viewing is not the best tool to be used on, on those kind of targets because we don't have enough feedback. Mm. Yeah. But you know that, that's where, as I said, where track records come in. If you if you can if you can show that you you have a consistent track record, say over a decade of a certain amount of, of you know credibility, then yeah. you know that there's you know, there's no real full reason why you should be off on that day, other than the possibility that it happens occasionally. Okay. Um, touch wood, though. I haven't been. I don't think I've been off target for. A, a long time as far as I as, as long as I can remember so it's, it's really imperative that you keep your records right and all your yes. paperwork right yeah yeah and as an example um I can you know I know that we're going off on a tangent here but you know we're talking about all different kinds of stuff bear with me a second I'll find the file I'm just doing uh because I work in a company called crypto viewing we we do monthly predictions of the news and there's three of us, four of us as remote viewers, and we probably do about 10 to 15 monthly predictions. So uh, mm. in March, 28, between the 28th and the 30th of March, all, four, all, all of us work targets to try to predict what the top news stories were going to be for, for this April. Um, oh, yes. I'm sure that was a... <laughs> well, it's hard at the moment because, you know, all you can think yeah. is is coronavirus so you have to try to yeah. if that comes up you have to kind of acknowledge it but at the same time you have to kind of put it to one side but so far we haven't because because we're so all so busy doing doing you know i mean i must be doing for crypto viewing i must be doing i don't know say 20 remote viewing targets a month it's because we're so busy none of us have actually sat down and started date, databasing it so i i literally this month said okay from this month onwards i'm gonna database this month and then I'm going to go back for every one of our remote viewing sessions we've done over the two years, database that and track the accuracy. So I've just done a, a spreadsheet and I can show you the spreadsheet here that I've just created for it to give you an idea of how you can database some of your own stuff. Yeah, because I was wondering how you, you, you did, you progress that. Yeah, so I just created this and it's essentially just an Excel spreadsheet at this stage. Mm -hmm. And it says, uh, can you guys see this okay? Yes. Okay, so at the moment it's just got you know a category for viewer data when we did the uh, remote viewing, the prediction date is for uh, the topic, a brief outline of the prediction, and then I'm going to put in this cat uh, this column down here. I'm going to put in a uh, column if if the if it's a hit miss or an unknown um, because these are all for April yet yeah, I I can't score these. So there's yeah. my ones here. Let me see if I can zoom this in on this. Mm. There's my ones there. And I did, I did uh, one, two, three, <laughs> four, five, six, seven, eight. And I did 10, 10 news predictions for April, which are those. Dick did these. And I'm going to, yeah, so I got his in there. Edward did these ones. And Sita did all these. And essentially what I'm going to do is I, after the end of the month, I'm going to you know, see if any of these can be fed back upon and then put in a hit, miss or an unknown. And then yeah. I'm, I'm going to go back through every month that we've done and put them all in there and build a big spreadsheet. And I'm going to keep adding to it, you know, so, so at the end of this month, we'll be doing maze as well. Um, yeah, so I'm going to start and keep a big database. Um, but, you know, every remote viewer should try to do something like this. I know it's hard because... Yeah. Oh, this database is really boring and I find it boring as hell um, and the only other time I've ever databased is I took as a test subject I took an advanced CRV training uh, operational training um, course with a person called Colleen, Colleen Moranich and she works out of um, Lynn Buchanan camp <coughs> I took a I took a course with her for six months to see if they could expand their operational CRV to someone that hadn't been trained in Lynn's version of CRV, um, and that was the hardest six months work I've ever done in remote viewing. You know, she really pushed me hard. Um, 
but that involved databasing every every piece of work I did as, as well. Um, so that showed me the uh, the benefits of databasing, but it also showed me that I'm not the person that should be databasing. In re in reality, none of us should be databasing. You know, we should have a team of people. And you should have someone that loves databasing database your your results for you because mm -hmm. you know once you've done your remote viewing, you don't the last thing you want to do is spend another hour yeah. putting everything yeah. into a database because it's really boring. But over time, it's beneficial. And in most cases, like like Lynn's group, they used to they used to have a really great database, whereas they could go into it uh, and they could pick remote viewers to work on projects, um, dependent on their specific skill sets. So they could look back through the database and say, okay, let's pick five remote viewers that are really good at picking up on, you know, planes or whatever the target might involve, uh, mm. and you know, specifically choose a remote viewer for the the task ahead, which is got to be the best way uh, to do things really but as i said databasing is boring and uh, hardly anyone does it mm. thank you des yeah. what do you know about uh, like methodology or remote viewing in other countries governments if they came up with like their own methods or are they just copycatting like crv or do you know anything about that I've only heard rumors and seen stuff from uh, what the Russians may be doing, and that's only scant stuff that uh, people like Targ has talked about and Ed Mays brought back and, and discussed and stuff. Um, not a lot of other stuff is out there, to be honest, about what, what they may be doing. I mean, I've just read the, I've, I've pretty much this week, I've just, I think I showed you these books, you guys, these books. I've pretty much, I've just got one of these to go now, so I've read through. Uh, three of these this week, if you can see them. Oh, no, you can't see them very well, can you? Because of the uh, the screen there. Yeah, it's not showing you. Oh, they're they're holding a bunch of blue. <laughs> <laughs> so I read through three of those, and uh, that's got tons of research, and it does have lots of Chinese and Russian research in those. Um, some of the papers and bits and pieces, but, but not in huge detail. But to be honest, I don't think there's a huge amount out there. If anyone's doing it, they're keeping it pretty close to their chest, to be honest. Ed May, Ed May knows a lot more of it than me. And I think Joe Monigal knows quite a bit as well. He's met with some of the, uh, the Russian remote viewers and stuff. So he'd be the uh, person to ask on that, really. OK, so let me see if I can just plug in a hard disk for a second and find that Roswell session or something so I can show you the sketches. I've got so much RV stuff, I have to keep it on hard disk. I have a three, four terabyte hard, hard disk here of uh, remote viewing data that I've collected over the years. So let me see if I can find the right session now. Something like this one, I think. I remember the spaceship one you were on about, I think. That's not the one. Sorry about this, guys, just bear with me a sec. Okay, yeah, here's one. So uh, Russell asked a question about the sketching, um, and this is a remote viewing session I shared last week. It's from uh, uh, when I was tasked by uh, Farsight Institute to look at uh, the Roswell crash. And I think this is probably, this is probably the fourth remote viewing session in on paper. I did of about six, I, I believe. Um, and yes, yeah, you can see the target number I had for this was I think I'll probably just use the date on this one. It was probably something like Target 22 or uh, no, it was, it was Target. It was Mystery 15. So that was the that was the coordinate we had for it was uh, Mystery 15. But I when I did this, I used the date that I first started the remote viewing on. So that would be 1912 there. Yeah. So I did. I started it on the 19th of December, uh, 2016, I think. Okay. So yeah. So I just do my normal stuff here and go to Stage Two stuff. And then I move into stage three and I start doing some basic sketches. Um, 
and at first, you know, so it's like everything else, you write the coordinate and then I just write the first kind of uh, things that c come into my kind of mind kind of thing. Let me just bring some more people in. Hi guys. Uh, just try to catch up with this a second. I, I'm just going through one of my remote viewing sessions here to show some sketching. Uh, yeah, so I'm in stage three, um, writ the coordinate, and then I just go straight into my in, into my feeling of what the target feels like. And, you know, the initial pen stroke there was just a you know a really basic curved line, and then immediately I, I go into the next part of this here, and I, I extend it a bit longer and think, okay, there's definitely a bit more of a shape curve to this. And then you know the next line there it kind of shows me that there's all to the surface of this, it's got a bit of a bit of a wobbly kind of jelly kind of feel to it. And again, in this next sketch, and then I, it starts to form some words in my mind and wherever I get words, I always have to put these down as annotations. So you know, there I've got flowing curved shape form. Um, and I got that it's designed for speed and movement. So I move on to another page because I you know, hit the bottom of the page here. So you have to move to a new clean sheet. And again, I reiterate the coordinate do my line again and it literally for is, is for me I, I sometimes get an impression in my head that says okay you've got to do a curve and then I just say okay I'll do what my mind's telling me to do and I just literally just draw it and I wrote here this feels like a smooth curved arc structure with a surface it's man-made but artificial coat to touch uh, silky very touchable uh, with a flowing shape and the AOL there of aerodynamic so I then move to another page doing even more sketches. But here I've done a movement command. Um, I don't know if you guys know this, but you can actually key yourself with movements to move around the target. So I've essentially said to myself here, um, move to and then sketch and describe the structure in detail only. So it's, it's a bit like a, a kind of probe to tell myself, you know, don't focus on anything in the surrounding landscape, just focus <laughs> on the structure. Uh, so then I do my sketch here, and I've done this A and B here, and this is this is like a this deta details a, a movement, uh, and it shows it on paper here. And I think I learned this from uh, Tom McNair, one of uh, English's best students. I, I saw an RV session when he did this, so I asked him what it was all about, and he said it's a it's a movement command. So the A is where you started off, and the B is where <coughs> you're moving to, and the moving to is initiated by you know my words above. So I'm saying, okay, you know, that's what I want to do with, with the move to, and to describe and sketch it in detail. So I'm moving from my initial position, which was anywhere, because all this stuff before, I could have been anywhere in time and space. Now I'm saying I want to move to exactly where this tells me to go, a position to move it, uh, to sketch it in detail. And I slide to the B movement. And I just put the pen here, and as you can see, the sketch is starting to develop a little bit more now. There it was a little bit curved. But now I'm getting that little bit more details. It is definitely a proper solid curve, but you know you can start to see an edge form on it now. Again, I write more detail here saying this but feels curved, but at least one area of, of multiple curve flowing shapes. It's 60 to 100 feet in diameter and 20 feet high. Again, I've run out of space. You have to go to my next page. And on the next page here, um, again, I've got a stage free sketch, but the, as you can see, that this one's very basic, but now I'm starting to get a whole kind of feeling of what this shape might be in my mind, which is a bit like a, you know, a nut, a shiny nut type shape. Uh, and with that shape, you know, that in initiates a load more thoughts in my mind, uh, which I just write down uh, what they are. So this feels like a structure built to move. Its shape and flowing form cries out for movement. Its surface or skin feels metallic, but feels like it has embedded particles, uh, somehow crystalline in nature, probably a composite of materials. And the moment, the moment I, I wrote that and saw that, uh, I had this idea and picture in my mind of what the, uh, what the skin would look like if you were like focused in upon it, you know, like at a microscopic level. So that's what this sketch is here, looking at, you know, looking closely at the surface of the skin and seeing this kind of glowing uh, material that was moving off it, but it was also uh, moving and rotating in, in a direction around the, around the skin of the uh, object. And then I annotated that, you know, uh, uh, moving down to another page of stage three. Um, 
I've got to a stage now with my remote viewing where I write lots of words. Um, it's not standard procedure to do that, especially not within CRV, but I've kind of mutated my CRV over the years and trust myself now. So I allow myself to, to, uh, to write these paragraphs of words of feelings that I get rather than sometimes moving straight into the matrix column. Um, so it's not, it's not, uh, it's not traditional CRV anymore. It's, it's my own kind of private version of it. Uh, so, so that's why it probably looks different from most remote viewing sessions. So I'm just writing more details here about the, the craft and, you know, a bit more details about how it's moving. And then in stage three, again, I'm here again. And what am I doing here? Uh, I'm talking about how it can move in eight, 360 degrees in any direction. And in the moment I, ha I had the thought that it can move 360 degrees in every direction, I had the uh, AOL there of it's a submarine because, you know, you mind saying, oh, okay, there must be some kind of craft in water if you can move in, in any direction. Uh, and then I had details, you know, this can move in, uh, in air or in water. Uh, the movement feels both propelled, but also pulled or stretched. And I just go into more and more detail before I move into, into my stage four. Sometimes in stage four, I do sketches as well. Did I do any in this? Um, probably not, because it's getting near the end now. So that's it really. It starts, yeah, it starts off with basic lines and then just slowly slowly builds as I do the pages. But you know, as you can see here in, in stage three, it's a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven pages of sketching in stage three. So you can only really, or I can only really get that amount of depth if I, if I spend time with the target and um, yeah and do more than one page you know i get quite a lot of session rv sessions of people where they literally still only spend uh, you know especially in stage three and stage four they they still only spend one one page and then they they expect to, to nail the target you, but it doesn't work like that you have to really put your mind to it you know you're the detective you have to work the target to get the data at, at any point when you were doing that because uh, you, you said your mind told you to like do a curve did you ever have a visual i think i do get visuals um but it's or is it visuals it might be it's, it's like it's really hard for me to describe because it's very subtle um i might get visuals or it might just be a feeling because most most of rv for me i'd say 95 percent of it is just a real internal feeling in here somewhere okay that it's, so it's not like you're getting a, a mental image picture and and drawing it I may, I may in my mind get a, a, for a millionth of a second get a, an idea that it's a curve or, or that I need to draw a yeah. curve. But but yeah, it's not like I'm sat there and I got a, uh, I got a visual image in my mind at, at, at any time. At any time, no, it's more of a, for me. It's more of an internal feeling. Right. Okay. So Great. Thank you, Dad. It just feels like you know, like in that case, it just felt like I should be doing a curve shape, and then. I guess maybe because, you know, being a designer and a, a good drawer and all that kind of stuff, it's just, I just feel confident enough now just to let, just let my hand do what my, my feeling tells me, tells me to do. I don't quite, you know, I don't question it. Um, and that's, that's the key point is getting to a stage where you don't worry uh, about what you're writing anymore. You just let it flow without questioning. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yes, going, sorry. Yeah, go, go ahead. <laughs> um, going back to your crypto viewing targets, I noticed um, on a little panel that someone named Karen asked how they were actually tasked. Is it an open search? Is um, I, I my guess it probably is in that you're in in that you're sort of going for something over the next month or whatever. And you just do an open search, see what you pick up. But um, that's interesting. Um, it depends on what we target because we do lots of things in Crypto View, and we do um, we do the monthly news. You know, so we, you know, essentially, all, uh, there is no target for that. We're just said, okay, you know, someone just sends us an email and says, remember to get your remote viewing session in before the end of the month to tell us what next month's news is going to be. And then what I do then, and I can show you, I can actually show you in a while. Oh, 
let me uh, open one up here a second. I can show you one of my sessions. Um, let me see, where's my March prediction one for April? Predictions is text. That's got to be it. Nope, that's not it. Bear with me a sec here, guys. Uh, April news. Okay, so I'll share the screen a sec. So on, on, on the news ones, and I, bear in mind, we don't all do it like this. I do it differently from the other guys. And I do my, I'll show you the crypto ones as well. So let me share the screen here a sec. <coughs> So, you know, on the, on the news ones, we're front loaded in the fact that I'm sat down and I'm thinking I've got to do an RV session on what the news is going to be next month. So, you know, you can do with that, you know, as you wish really, you know, because we are front loaded. We know we're going for the news. Um, and in the back of my mind, I'm kind of thinking to myself, okay, I want to do several sweeps to see what the top global news is going to be and what i do is and you know i always write that on the sessions as well so here's my rv session i did this on the 30th uh march um and i start off here at the top and i you know i always do all my cues and this is cues to myself in brackets so i know i'm looking at news but on this one i said to myself okay what is the top global news story is going to be in april 2020 and in the moment I write that and use the uh, use my my number here below the uh, three three zero zero one, I then go into doing the ideogram and here's the data for that one. And then I will move to another. Did I key myself? No, I automatically on this move straight into an, a second thing. It started once it started going to the end of this page two, it went straight to a whole new ideogram here, which I knew instantly it was trying to show me the markets then. Um, but I think this is because I've been doing this for two years now, trying to look ahead at the news. In, t in, in my internal process, in my mind, it kind of knows to go that I need to look at the top news. I need to look at what the top UK news is going to be. I need to look at what the markets are going to do. I need to look at what the top cryptocurrency news is going to be. And then I kind of do a section where I say, okay, what's the top horrible things that's going to happen in news? Because they always get to the you know, top news more than anything else. So I think my internal process kind of knew I was, at the, I was at the end of the information on this first one here. And in this ideogram, it just went straight into start, starting to tell me what the markets were going to be. So there's, there's, that's what I got for the world markets for this, uh, for April. Again, more stuff there. And then I probably, uh, this is all market information for April. So I got here, you know, a diagram and seeing lots of red charts showing red blocks going down below a baseline, you know, to negative charts. And lots more negative charts. Ooh. That's bad. Um, and then, I, as you can see here, I've self-cued myself again here. So uh, on, this, on this part of the news, I'm saying to myself, okay, what's the top crypto news going to be in April 2020? And it's the moment I write that and do my, my, my key queue number, and I just write information there. And as you can see, I've, you know, I've got an AL there, AL there of Bitcoin. And the second page here, I've got a, a sketch. I feel, see this really big V-shaped move, uh, movement and there's going to be a big bounce or a rebound. It feels like, you know, a positive feel that it's going to go up to 11K. Um, and, you know, I've got the AL there of Bitcoin. And at the beginning of the month, it's, uh, Bitcoin started off, I think it's something like 6K. I think it went up to 7.5 uh, and people were estimating it could, you know, it could go right up above 8k at the moment so yeah, we'll see what it's like at the end of the month again i move on a new page here and i cue myself again let's look for more crypto news for april and it comes up with this and i start drawing a logo this this double triangle logo and i had a feeling that i need to watch for this because it's going to move up and then I cue myself with, you know, because I don't want to ignore it, you know, because the, the COVID stuff's out there in the news. So rather than ignore it, I try, try to do a little bit on it and then dispel it and get it out of the way. So my cue for this is COVID-19, top news for April. And then I got here 58,000 deaths uh, in the US. Uh, several simultaneous peaks, overlapping peaks in the US. Uh, some people in panic mode because uh, it's hard to contain at that point. 
point of critical mass in the US of it. Uh, I had a feeling that something around about 17th and 18th that there's going to be an event that's going to trigger trigger something important to do with this uh, COVID-19, but I don't know what. So I'm going to, I've got a note there to watch for this on 17th or 18th. Um, yeah, so it's all US based, this, and it says it's getting a quite catastrophic in the US, very, very bad, all that kind of stuff. Jesus. Now then I cue myself with COVID-19 cure treatment in April 2008, just to see if I can pick up if anything's going to develop. And I had on this that something might come out of um, somewhere not in the US. Um, a potential treatment found in April, April, but it's in a remote lab, uh, destroys or nulls it from the inside out or something, and there's a, it mixes a hybrid or something. It feels like a woman's talking about it. To me, <laughs> uh, and it's got the word, something to do with the word I, but who knows on that, you know, we'll have to wait and see. So then I moved to another page. Hydro Hydroqualic well, I can't pronounce it. Hydroquality. Yeah, someone, someone I said it might be, yeah. might be that to me, but yeah, I don't know yet. I, I like to wait to the end of the month just to see, you know, what what comes out and if it's accurate. So then I move on to this, and this is literally just looking at more top news in April, and all this is just talking about some kind of uh, European structure that's to deal with art and classical stuff in in Europe that uh, has some kind of fire and it gets destroyed. So I'm just talking about that. And then right at the end, I got this weird, good kind of good time kind of story where there's two people on individual structures communicating with a barrier in between. I don't know what that means, but it seems to be some kind of media story that's got a good, good feel about it. And the very final stuff here is talking about uh, a lot of angry people. And it felt like it was in a, a, some kind of South American destination. And it feels like they're going to have some kind of serious revolt or underground revolution that's building uh, we've got lots yeah. of no answers all, all that kind of stuff so that's how i would do a news one and you know i'm self-queuing myself to look for certain things on that uh, bear with me a second I'll, and i'll show you a proper crypto one um have i got any cryptos let's pick one from the last month Okay, um, so we also do cryptocurrencies, and these are blind, so I'm just giving a number on this, and a number on this one. Uh, the number on this target was 3211. Uh, so I, I, when I'm doing these cryptos as well, again, I'm front-loaded in the fact that I know I'm looking at a crypto viewing. So that's good in the way that I, uh, it allows me now, uh, because CRV out of the box is, is, is a great tool for, for training in being psychic, but it's as an operational tool for getting information, it's terrible. Um, so, but, but what you can do with CRV is you can change it and tailor it towards the, uh, the area of interest that you're looking at. So no, by knowing that I'm looking at, uh, I have to look for a crypto and, you know, I am front loaded in that, but there are 6,000 cryptos out there. So, you know, I've got like a one in 6,000 chance of essentially getting it right on a, on a weekly basis. Um, so I know it's a crypto, but that tells me that I need to look for certain things and I specifically go looking for those certain things in my session. So what I will do is I will, I know I'm working a crypto target, so I will try to draw the logo to identify that. And I know that if I nail the logo each month, then it's a good indicator that the rest of the session data is accurate. Uh, so I know I try to draw the logo. I then try to describe accurately the CEO that's involved with that crypto. I then try to draw the technology or the, the actual product that that crypto is about. And then I then try to look at the, uh, the, the, the group sentiment of all the people that are interested and invested in that, in that currency in a, in a period of time in the future is usually something like 12 or 18 months to see how they feel about it, you know, see if, if it's made money for them or if they're, if they're upset. And then I, then I do a, a graph and I'll show you all this. So I am front loaded, but you know, on, as I said, with the cryptos, there's about 6,000 of them at the, at the moment. So I got one in 6,000 chance of, of you know, getting a crypto but knowing knowing the area where you're looking 
but not having any specific data allows you to tailor the remote viewing. And I, and I did this on, I do this on my missing people work as well. I don't do it anymore, but this is how I used to work. Knowing I was working at a person target also allowed me to change how, CR, how I did CRV on the paper to get the data needed to find a missing person. So it allowed me then to use tools to start at the, uh, the missing person's last known location, looking north, and then all maps and angles and directions and, and areas to where I think that person was. Um, but again, you know, knowing it was a missing person still meant that there were hundreds of billions of people that it could have been, so I was still fairly blind. So on, on the crypto target, so this is just like, a, this is how we do a normal war, and this is how I do it, the other guys do theirs differently. So this is a crypto target of me. Um, straight off the bat here, I just got, uh, it's high energy. They're feeling really enthusiastic about it. Feels like a very enthusiastic person who's in charge. Uh, there's a flurry of activity here. It's gonna have, this is showing me that it's almost like sh showing me through ideograms the, uh, the flow of the currency, you know, because if you look at cryptocurrencies, and I can show you some, they go up and down and up and down. And this is showing me, is, you know, it's going to be going up and down, but eventually it's going to have some gains. Again, it's showing me some more positive stuff there about the direction. Uh, it feels loved. People got feel really good about this. They're very energetic. So now I try, and I, here I've used a cue. So move to and sketch and describe the brand or logo. And what target is this? This is IOST. So let me have a look at it. So there's, there's a thousand of these. IOST. Crypto. <clears throat> so that's that's their logo. Let's try to open this up side by side. Is that it? I think yes. And uh, the strange thing on this one is, which is great on this example actually. So I'm I'm telling myself I'm keying myself to look at the logo. And bear in mind, you know, I know it's a crypto, but there are six thousand of them. So I start drawing these dark linear shapes here and I'm saying it's very linear angular, angular and it's, it's got verticals to it. And then I've got a string completely out of nowhere. I've got the word isotope. But, but if you have a look, the actual spelling mm. of, the, of the brand of this as a target is IOST, which is like, you know, the four letters of isotope. So it's almost like it was trying to tell me the name of the target there in some random word that I, I've never had in a, in a remote viewing view session before. Um, and I knew, you know, I draw a circle, so I knew it was a coin. I knew it was a, a, a coin and I knew it was fluctuating. And I, I tried to draw the logo a bit more detail. So as you can see here, it's tall, dark, linear, vertical bits. It's bold, confident. It's really in your face. There's two parts to this. It's connected, um, but also not connected. So that's the logo bits that I tried to drew, draw. Uh, and then I, on the crypto thing, I cue myself to move to the top life uh, for the target and then describe him. So I've got Mel, he's 33 plus, he's white, very confident, leader in the industry, very social media. Can you share the screen, Dennis? Sorry? Can you share the screen? Are you not seeing that one? I see it. No. I can see it. Yeah, I see it. Ah. Yeah. Okay, hang on. Ah, uh, yes, I got it. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so I've got Diesel there. He's a good leader. He's educated. He's American. Or that's an AOL of American. That's a bit of a guess. Um, a bit more detail about the guy there, where he's working. Proud of his baby there at the bottom. And then I do a bit where I look at the team. So I cube myself here with the in, in the brackets here to look at the team. And I've got three males, close friends. They're a core. They feel like school buddies, and, there's sec and there's a second tier of people underneath them, so there are four people underneath them, mainly male, but they've got a female person in as well. And then I, mo I move myself around again, so I've moved myself here to sketch and describe the tech or product, and I try tr drawing, I don't know, whatever comes into my mind, and at this, po this point it looks like some kind of chain link thing, and I've got services, and there's a distribution network, compact layers of code, uh, transactions at great speed, uh, very secure, very speedy. So yeah, lots of details here that I don't really know what it's talking about. You know, this could be useful in factories, industry, lots of different uses for this target. 
feels way well integrated. Then I moved to the, the hodlers. So I got here, moved to and described the hodlers group sentiment. And hodlers, uh, that's the, the hodlers is the code kind of word. Um, yeah, and it, it means people that hold it. But when the person started talking many decades ago about people holding cryptocurrency, they typed it so fast that they, they got the L and the D mixed round. So ever since then, they, they don't call them holders, they call them hodlers. Um, so what I'm doing with this is I'm looking at, I'm trying, I'm, I'm tasking myself to look at the, uh, the entire group of people that, that have bought this cryptocurrency and how do they feel as a, as a group entity about it. Uh, so I'm looking at a, an entire group sentiment from tens of thousands of people, say. So at, at this point where I'm looking at in 16 months time from the date of doing this, which was uh, February of this year, in 18 months time, uh, 16 months from February of this year, they're, they're bold, they're happy, they feel they've achieved something, it feels very comfortable, they feel okay and semi-satisfied. Um, but they don't feel fully satisfied at this stage. And then what I do, and none of the others do this in crypto viewing, is I have a chart with a start point, six months, 12 months, and 18 months. And I literally just let my pen go on the chart there to see if it's going to do any peaks or up down movements. So that's, that's almost like a visual representation of where I, how I think the price of it's going to go over the next uh, 18 months. And then last of all, I just do any other three words that come into my mind, I do those. Now for cryptos, I can show you what they're like. If, uh, so this is the main website for them. So at the moment, as I said, there's five and a half thousand cryptos out there. IOST, uh, here's IOST. So essentially what I'm trying to do is look at this chart and see where this would go, but not now, see where this would go, you know, over and over the next uh, 18, 18 months for the, for the people. And here's all the details about I, uh, IOST, what they're about and, and so on. But I, you know, as I said, I don't know any of this before I'm doing it. And I tater, I tater the remote viewing, as I, as I said, I love stuff, fantastic, but out of the box, it's not the best thing for operational use. And I tater, every remote view I do slightly differently to <laughs> the goals that the, uh, the, 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 the target demands, you know, doing this is, I, I do this a different way than I would do looking for a missing person. So. That's highly, that's highly impressive, Daz. That really, really is. And um, it's given me some ideas actually on how to perhaps improve my, <laughs> what I get. Um, yeah, yeah, that's, and especially the isotope, iso, you know, yeah, yeah, I was quite shocked at that when it came out because you know I've never had isotope come out in session before, so I AOL'd it, and then when I saw that the target was called IOST, and that's the first four letters of that isotope, and you know, it's almost like you know I didn't have any prior experience of IOST because it's not one I've bought into or researched or anything. Um, so your mind tries to grab the nearest thing closest to whatever IOST would be in in your, in your vocabulary that you encountered at any point in your life and I, I have obviously seen the word isotope or something used in books and films and stuff and that's the closest thing it could grab to try to tell me what it was yeah and and the news and the crypto can all potentially be validated so yes yes i mean we do we, to me I, is the most important thing yes yeah, yeah. we do the cryptos I mean, I can't, they're not blind because we are front loaded, you know, we know it's a crypto, but as, as, as I showed you on that chart, there are, there are five and a half thousand at the moment. So yeah, it's one in five and a half thousand chance of getting it right. And, you know, every, pretty much every month, I, you know, as you saw from the, the word isotope and ISO and IOST and the graphics and stuff, I'm pretty good at getting the, uh, the branding down pat, you know, in, in everything that I do for it and everything. So that's a good indicator to me that I'm on target. The rest of it, we just have to wait and see, you know, like when I was saying, this is how, this is how the people that own it feel in 18 months. That's just a guess. But what we're saying to our clients is, and we've always said this to them, this isn't financial information. This is, you know, this is essentially an entertainment here. But use this information that we've given you today with everything else you can look at in the market to see, you know, see if they're doing any deals, to see if the CEO is, the, is, is exactly as we're describing him and then make an informed decision on if you want to uh, put your money into that in, in somewhere or another. Yeah, 
looks great. That really is. Yeah. Hey, Dads, I have an Ingo question. Uh, early on in his work when he was being tested and stuff, I remember reading one of his books. He talked about uh, they would put him in a copper lined room and he would meditate. Um, and I, I believe he talked about how he felt it would amplify his intuitive faculties and stuff to the point where he couldn't shut it off at times. Can you comment on that? Do you, do you know what I'm referring to? Seeing talk of that, I don't know much about it myself though. Um, and the only tools I use personally is, uh, you know, and I don't use it so much nowadays, is, is, is meditation. I don't use anything external, other, other than music maybe. I listen to music with my RV. Um, yeah, so I don't know about if anything would help in any way, in, in any way to, you know, to, to help that. I do know that Ingo also did some work with, was it Parsinger, Michael Parsinger or someone? I, I've got the report, he sent me a report, um, where he had a, a cap with electrodes that they put on Ingo as he was doing his RV to measure his brain waves and state of mind and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and Ingo apparently had a really unique uh, state of mind. And if I remember what he said correctly, he said something about uh, they recorded the state of mind that Ingo could go into in some way, and they can now uh, play that back as a state of mind for other people when they're trying to re remote view and apparently it makes them better doing their remote viewing or something. If I remember him correctly when he said that to me, I'm, going, so, I'm, thinking, I'm thinking back a couple of years now. Thanks, Dad. Isn't, isn't this about not having to go into meditation before you do it, but just live sort of in a meditation so you pick up more anyway and not have to keep proving it? <clears throat> I think with this, what they did when they recorded Ingo's brainwaves and stuff is it, it, they managed to find a way to artificially, uh, you know, so you'd be able to put on a pair of headphones or put this cap on and they'd be able to play Ingo's brainwave into, into you or in some way. And then it would enhance what you were doing with remote viewing. Yeah, but aren't we doing that anyway? Because we um, are switching off from the sort of emotion of life and being detached to be able to just use our remote view in any way in everyday life? It depends how you remote view. I mean, I used to meditate before I, I RV'd. Now I just literally, you know, and I usually sit right here and, and do, do most of my remote view. And I'll just, you know, I may get off the phone with a client or something and like just grab my, my, my tablet and just put my headphones on and just go straight into it. I don't, I don't try to zone out and get into a zone or anything. But you know, other, pe other people do. But perhaps you're you're already in that zone anyway, so you don't need to sort of meditate formally because you're living it more. I I don't know. Uh, I'm not an advocate for all the things that people talk about, like left side of their brain, right side of their brain. You know, going to the theta delta. All that. Yeah, I you know, I'm I'm a normal CRV guy, so I just I just sit down with the pen and just just do it. I don't think about any of that. Oh yeah. That's where I am really with it all, and I, I don't understand quite why you. It seems to be that some people are suggesting we need to prove that we're doing it, and we get proof through what actually we we deliver the information, and we don't have to prove that it is true. We just deliver it. Yeah. Uh, can I just mention that I've taken part in experiments on the brain. Uh, where you go into altered states and um, it, it, they can, as the uh, spirit come in, um, they can tell by the monitor. And also uh, we've been working with a university who've been scientifically proven about the altered states of the mind as well. So I think with remote viewing, uh, that could also be taken into account if if you you can measure where your brain um, or the mind actually not the brain the mind our consciousness goes on different levels as we're working. Yeah, yeah, and uh, I know that in in the in the books here that I've shown you, uh, from 
86 to 95, uh, Ed May and SRI, and then they you know, moved it to SAIC. Um, they did extensive research with, with all kind of uh, magnetic imaging of the brain, ECGs, and all the extensive stuff. And they, they do have really good data on all, how all that works and the best states and all this kind of stuff. But yeah. you know, being a remote viewer, that's always worked pretty much on my own without having any teams around me and stuff. That's not something I've really bothered. No, it, it possibly can interfere with um, your natural ability. You know, when you're trying to um, be like a monkey in an experimental yeah. lab. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah I, I think that puts more pressure on and. You're actually better to just go with what you are uh, without having to do all that. But yeah. I think, yeah. It's just the science scientists are just looking to validate things. Yeah, but we don't need to validate yeah. because we know it happens. We know we can do it. Yeah, no, but, but, think, people, well, but people are interested, aren't they, in trying to... We know we can do it, but... Uh, they're also trying to um, validate us, if you like. Science. Uh, in, in the scientific. Yeah. Uh, science well. isn't, you know, science isn't happy, uh, doesn't feel we validated enough. And, you know, in the, I, was, I was reading it today, the last, uh, the last book here, book four, it was detailing, you know, the, the good last quarter of the book details essentially the death of the, uh, the Stargate program and how that came about. Um, and, you know, there's lots of, you know, there, there were lots of people way back in the military circles, DIA and the CIA, uh, way back in 95, that just, you know, no matter how much you put in front of them, they just were not convinced it didn't work. And the people that, uh, that wrote the final report that closed the program from a AIR, um, who did, the, did the, this, pro they did a program review on behalf of the CIA, you know, before the CIA closed it. Um, they, they looked at, they, they didn't look at all the data, but they looked at 10 key reports that was given to them and they had the opportunity to interview the entire staff of the Stargate uh, program. Uh, and, you know, they were, I guess, I mean, it might have been a foregone conclusion anyway, but, you know, these are allegedly credible scientists and they weren't, they weren't happy with what they see with the evidence, you know. They, no, but when you, when you look at what Alex was saying um, from France about how, his clients don't need him to prove they just accept and they yeah. allow him to do because he's getting the results anyway yes. and i think the more we aren't confident enough the more we feel we need to justify the worse we get at our results actually it, it quite possibly don't work that way. i mean with the crypto viewing community um it, it's interesting we've got this really great relationship because it's not like normal businesses where you have a client business relationship uh, we essentially put out this information and content, you know, everything we, done is, we do wrapped up is, is fun and informative content. And so we have this relationship where, you know, most of the people, they just, you know, they're just happy to see us doing things and just to explore the other side of life. Some of them, so, you know, and I do get people all the time saying, thanks for the information. I acted upon it. You know, you saved me money, you made me money, all this kind of stuff. But a lot, and the major proportion of people just, just just following just out of interest really you know they they you know they don't really care if it shakes their belief on whether it's real or not right yeah. i'm just gonna see what some of these questions are so let's see what what people ask here um can i ask david a quick question yeah go for it was your story about the copper room in psychic sexuality i believe it was because i know yeah. i read that one yeah he he elaborates on that and then, Daz, I posted for you, uh, it was Michael Persinger that did the experiment, and they called it the God Helmet. That's the one, yes. And to answer Julie's question, so what they did was they recorded the EMF or the magnetic field going on around Ingo while he viewed, and then by uh, effectively recreating or, or capturing that or, or recreating it for another, that put that person more in the EMF field that Ingo was in. So it was, it was some interesting experimentation. Yeah, yeah. So um, the question. Hey, Dad, I, um, hey, hey, this is Kavan from uh, Boulder, Colorado. Yeah, uh, 
yeah, it, it's great to meet you, Dad. Uh, so I, I initially started off with uh, your work, and then you know I'm I'm right now a full time Thai researcher. But anyway, uh, I just want to uh, you know uh, you know ask you that uh, whether if you've had any experience in uh, viewing numbers or letters as such. Um, well, I mean, I just showed an example just now where I got kind of some letters, although that wasn't that was accidental. I did do a, a yeah. couple of test projects where I tried to do lottery numbers. Um, uh -huh. And I did manage on several occasions to get uh, five sets of numbers out of the seven sets of numbers. And I had a really weird phenomena going on. I, I mean, I posted all the stuff on a, on a, on a forum called 10,000 Roads, TKR. So it's, it's probably still up there. But I had this weird thing of, of where I was, like with the Euro Minions in the UK, it's, I can't remember what it is, it's like between zero and 50. And then there's two two numbers that are off to the side as well, but so it's like uh, zero to zero to ten, uh, you know, eleven to twenty, you know, twenty-one to thirty, and all that kind of thing. I had this really weird thing, whereas if I would get like number seventeen, uh, the correct number would be eighteen; it would be one away. Right. And then in the next yeah. column, if I got twenty-three, the real number mm -hmm. would be twenty-two. Yeah. So, okay. I, it's really strange. I would have like, you know, and I and I would have, I would have two, maybe two correct numbers where I get them spot on, but then I'd get three numbers that were in the right, in the right category for the, you know, between ten and twenty and so forth. But they would be, they would always be, always be one away in each one. Are there still the group? Are there still the groups doing um, work in Las Vegas in the um, casinos? I know HRVG did quite a bit of work there, um, and Dick's covered that, and they won quite a bit of money allegedly. Um, and I know uh, sometimes when uh, the APP people meet up, they they do some, you know, they do horse racing and, and betting and, and that kind of stuff. Mm. Yeah, but yeah, is, if you're interested in all that kind of stuff, I would, if I were you, I would join Marty's APP program because they have. They have, uh, I mean, tens of tens of thousands of viewers now working on that, working on uh, ARV projects, yeah. trying to make money. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not interested okay. in it, <laughs> but I just wondered because they were doing a regular sort of once a month, weren't they, in the casinos, yeah. in the ethical ones? Yeah. And yeah, I don't know. I don't. It's not. Although I tried numbers and it was quite fun for a while, it's. Uh, it's not something I find really interesting, so I find it hard to infuse. My, I, you know, don't get me wrong; it'd be great to win like a hundred million on the lottery or something, but whether or not I find it really well, hard to infuse myself. Not an area I'm at all interested in, and horse yeah. racing and all that lot I'm not interested in. I'd much rather use it for sort of proper finding people, finding things, and that sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. not more I mean, interesting things. Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, for me, uh, especially, you know, I've been working with uh, random number generators as such. So, uh, you know, the lottery systems, uh, you know, you know, show up to be a really uh, good classical uh, random system for me. So that's the only, you know, motivation as such. But then, you know, it's really interesting, Daz, uh, uh, where is that you said, you know, the blog that you mentioned where uh, you have, you know, you had these things recorded or, you know, posted? It was yeah, called, what, um, it's not so active anymore, but it used to be, for about okay. uh, i would say probably about a decade it used to be the primary place to go to on the internet to find remote viewing and it's great because they can they've got this thing where they can set targets and all this kind of stuff and it was a discussion forum uh abbreviated it's called tkr but it was uh it's called Ten Thousand roads and it was run by okay. uh, pj gannier for a number of years hmm. and it's, cool. it's pre-social media so yeah, uh, in the in the nineties to mid two thousands, it's like where everyone went to discuss anything to do with remote viewing. I think they've still got an audience there now, but you know because of social media, it's vastly vastly reduced. Cool, that's great. Thank you, appreciate that. So some of these questions: uh, Do you do you always work without a monitor? Always. I've never in twenty four years, I've never had a, a, um, anyone in the room as a monitor uh, for me, or even you know uh, remotely. But saying that on the Courtney projects and some of them, uh, some some of the other ones with other people as well, I do have a kind of remote uh, project manager. So sometimes you might do a remote viewing, uh, you might do a whole session, you know, 20, 30 pages, and they may come back to you and say, okay, you, you know, 
on page six, you, you, you wrote this word or did this sketch. Can you do me another remote viewing session on that? So that in a way is having that almost like a remote monitor. Um, and I've worked in that way, but I've never, I've never, uh, never had one live with me in, in the room or anything. And I, I probably ne would never want to. I mean, yeah, I might want that. I might do it. I mean, I, we've got some- An interesting process, Daz, I'd say. And I'm amazed how um, helpful I've found it. But also, I know I can also do it without. And that's where, when you say you revisit stuff, we still do that um, when we've got a monitor and then we feed the information back to the coordinator mm -hmm. and they prompt us as to, you know, right, go back and look at this, this bit. And that's been really helpful. Yeah, I'm having not, a third there. I might explore it um, because it, at the moment in the works, um, me and a couple of the guys, uh, the crypto viewing guys, we're, we're talking to a couple of... Uh, preliminary talks with a couple of TV companies at the moment about doing uh, a couple of remote viewing series and oh, the way yeah. they're kind of done. Uh, I don't know if you guys have seen, it's going to be almost along similar lines to um, the Curse of Oak Island in kind of feel. Oh, and cool. So, uh, yeah. Well, if, if you ever fancy having a go, Daz, we could do it remotely. We could do it online. Maybe I'm 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 just a bit wary about not breaking what's not already broken. I, mean, I you know I don't ah, but you don't know what's not broken or what might be different. You can always quit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't know. I've just never seen the need really. No, I wouldn't hey, say Des. That, but De it's a different way of working. Um, any more questions here? What do you say? How many woo-woo targets are you guys hitting on uh, on crypto viewing? Like once a month, you guys hit a woo-woo target, or no? It's not that frequent. Um, we did just do one, and I think Dick's going to put it out for free. Um, there's talk for that anyway, and it was a it was a really strange one because it was uh, on this thing called the Code of Hammurabi, which is this, uh, and you can Wikipedia search for it. Is this code that was written down, Babylonian code that was given to, to humans and it was written down on this on this stone and it's essentially a code that um, started uh, started human society, human civilized society really so we had, look, we had a look at that to see where the origin was that came from and um, but frequency wise I think in the two years I've been doing the um, the crypto viewing um, I've probably had four woo kind of mystery targets and so not many at all one every six months or so i've set them a couple i don't know if you've seen them online um i set uh, you know uh, because i was talking to the, the team of people behind um there's a series called hellier and they got like this kind of weird kind of like ufo type goblin type thing going on there yeah uh, that was a good one and i yeah. set the t i set the team that as, as a target to see if they could get what was coming out in the documentary and they got such good stuff that I went to the documentary makers and they were blown away from it and they saw all the evidence and then we had ended up, ended up having a Skype call with them uh, and you know they said they and they were they were pleased they said you're you know you guys in your RV have, have got data that we didn't even release on the on on the TV channel so they were pleased with that but that was me setting them a, a mystery target um, but yeah frequency wise I think I didn't or one every six months or something so hardly any at all it's mainly news and and cryptocurrencies and, and would they have been working without a monitor they uh, they they don't work N none of us work with monitors i don't all think right. i don't think dick's worked with a monitor since he was you know way back in hrvg probably about eight ten years ago uh edward i don't know what edward does because he does quite a lot of stuff on his own channel uh, i think he has some monitor sessions now and again Mm. yeah so we all work you know slightly differently in, in our own ways kind of thing yeah yeah and it's good to be flexible to work either way yeah i guess I've, i just never i mean if i did work with a monitor uh and they were in close proximity or talking to me i would have to insist that they knew nothing about the target whatsoever can i just ask then if you don't work with a monitor who sets your target coordination? 
Well, it depends who I'm working with, you know, because I work with loads of different people. But, you know, I just get someone kind of mean, someone who I, and I don't work with everyone, but, you know, they have to be trusted people. And they'll come to me and say, you know, I've got a project. Would you work a project? It might be this time scale and, in, you know, in this time in the future, would you do it? And I, I, I agree. And essentially, all I get by email is, it be, here's your target number. Send me the session when you've done it. And that's the only communication I have. Right, okay. Like on the far side ones with Courtney, I always knew I was working a Courtney project, but he would just say to us, okay, and it's now project, you know, 16. Do your yeah. RV and get it back to me when you when you can. That's that's the only communication I would get is is that. And then I wouldn't ever I would hardly ever use the num you know the target sixteen. I would just make up make up my own numbers for it. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's what I love about your target monkey is it's just numbers and not letters. Where whereas when I started, we would use letters as well, and I find they can be more um, distracting. Yeah, crypto viewing. I mean, Dick and Edward always use uh, a coordinate with with letters and numbers, uh, but I force them and I make them do a whole set of numbers just for me, just with numbers. Because yeah, I find at times, and I've seen it in people's sessions, if they, you know, if it just randomly comes out and you get slight words or beginning of words, you know, and you know your target number maybe ET ninety four, yeah, seven eight one. You know, the fact that it says ET in it, it just starts your mind going off on a tangent thinking that it's mm -hmm. going to be UFO and ET based. So I would totally refuse to do anything. You know, it's got to be numbers. And if they do give me a letter one, I just ignore it. And just, as I said, I just use the date that I'm doing the RV session on and say that that's, that's my numbers for this RV. And in yeah. fact, a few weeks back, and I've done this several times with crypto viewing, uh, they've said, okay, you know, we'll set, we'll set you a new crypto target next week. Just, just give me some time to get round to it. But, you know, I've been sat at home thinking to myself, well, you know, I've got a day to day where I ain't got nothing to do. So I'll do the yeah, target yeah. now. So, so I essentially do the target uh, and I use it and I, and I would literally write on the top of the page, uh, this is the target for the next crypto viewing session they will send me. Um, and I'll just make up some numbers. And mm. I, I do the target before they've even in their own mind thought about what target they want to be remote viewed. Yeah, yeah. That's the amazing thing about remote viewing, actually. Yeah. Yeah. But that is when you don't even need to meditate to do it, isn't it? Yeah. 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 So this is, and it's funny because you know, I, you know, and we got these on video because you know, it's data like. In fact, I did one last, last, one that what like a few weeks ago for this. Uh, I said, well, you know, it's just going to be potluck wherever I hit this target, or not because you know I did the remote viewing before you even knew what you wanted us to remote view. Um, yeah. And, and again, it still still nailed the target with the logo and 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 everything. <laughs> So it all, it all works. And, you know, people like Joe McMoneagle as well, you know, you've probably all seen him do RV or, or demonstrations. But, you know, he said himself that he never does the RV live on the day. It always, in the quiet of his own home, do the real RV the night before. And then uh -huh. when he's there in the studio the next day, he's just repeating what he did the night before. Yeah, so at least then he's, he's not got performance anxiety and stuff, has he? Yeah. yeah. And, and that's a big thing within remote viewing because you're only as good as your your last set of data really yeah yeah it is becoming more of a it is almost becoming more of a a performance art because in the early days and you know i guess yeah, a lot of you guys are still doing stuff on paper and stuff and that that's that's all great but we've moved as a society onwards now and there's so many more people wanting on in media and video and all this kind of stuff that yeah, the remote viewing starts to become a, a performance more than it is uh, anything else. And that's hard to do, especially if you're doing it on your own. And I've said this to many people, you know, because when I'm, you know, you guys probably seen some of my videos of, of me doing RV. And it's not just a case of doing the RV. Um, you know, I, I also have to set the cameras and work the cameras. You know, there's probably two cameras there and the sound and keying yourself up the microphone and I've got four sets of lights I'm working and seeing if the four sets of lights are on and then you've got to go onto the whiteboard and do an RV session whilst thinking about all that stuff that's going on. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's amazing that you're able to do that. <laughs> it's like during session, you're actually able to interact like, yeah, now I'm getting this and that. Like, I'm so busy in session, like writing, it's a, it's a good skill you got there. It's, it's crazy hard. And, you know, it's all, it's only happened over the last couple of years and it's a, it's all learn learn skills and you know if you could you know when i have to set up to do an rv session on a whiteboard if you could you guys don't get to see it but if you could see the complete mess that's around with 
you know, two lights there, two video cameras, mic'd up, all the power leads, you know, linking it all up, all over the floor. Then you have to set up your whiteboard. You have to run your videotape to make sure that it looks good, you know, for your test bit. You have to check that the audio comes out. And then you're kind of thinking, so, okay, now I have to call myself down and actually do the remote viewing. It's just like, oh, this is just... A lot of distractions. <laughs> yeah. It would just be so... Oh, so to have a studio. Oh, those distractions walking. actually help you. <laughs> those distractions yeah. might enhance honest, it. <laughs> it, might be that. it might be like the uh, writing your name and stuff at the top of the CRV paper. It might be a distraction, enough of a distraction that you're not there worried if you're going to nail the target or not. So it, it might be beneficial in a way. But yeah, if any of you guys <laughs> could see this. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Dad, I had another question. So since you mentioned the Stargate program and Ed May's work, uh, I am uh, specifically fascinated with uh, the entropy work that he has done. Yeah. Right? You know. So, uh, you know, he, you know, he, he found that remote viewers easily are able to find uh, highly entropic targets as such. Yes. And, uh, and he did use uh, liquid nitrogen uh, as a substitute near targets to basically, you know, attract the mind kind of a thing. Yeah. So do you, uh, what, what's your take on that? Like, you know, in terms of displacement uh, and, you know, in terms of the reading and the accuracy as such. So what do you think, uh, you know, if you, if you look at remote viewing as an art, which is going... Uh, you know, in, in that direction as such. So, um, yeah. Targets, I mean, it's, you know, they found that the amount of, is it Shannon entropy within a target, data-wise, uh, made better better targets. And um, essentially what that means is the amount of change within a target uh, helps that target become a better target and easier for the remote viewer to see. Um, yeah, and I, I totally agree. Uh, I, you know, you, Sometimes, and I've done targets for skeptics where they kind of say, uh, you know, if you can remote view, do a test to me, and you'll find that they'll pick a, you know, they'll, without training, they'll pick a target and they'll be like, it'll be like, you know, they'll pick up, I, I won't do enough to this show, but they'll pick up like a little object like this, which is sat next to a computer and expect you to be able to remote view that in exquisite detail. But because it's so small, and insignificant, and it has no energy and no change about it, it, it essentially is a really bad example of a remote viewing target and that's what that's what ed, ed may and that found it yeah and it makes sense and you know if you think about uh uh along the lines of uh, a hunter or, or a soldier you know you're in a you're in a battlefield and you're, and you're looking for information uh or you're you know you're a hunter you're in a field with a gun you think you know you want to shoot you know you want to shoot the, the next target kind of thing the thing that allows you to home in on that next target, that target for you to get that data from and to shoot is when you see, when you see movement in your field of vision where there is no other movement. And I think it's, yeah. the, same, I think it's the same with remote viewing. Movement and energy is an attractor. Um, the change is, is mm -hmm. an attractor. So a, a target that has lots of movement and change. And, you know, we find this all the time. Targets that have lots of moving water in, for example, usually, especially in the ARV targets, if you have two targets in, one of them's a structure over yeah. here, and it's really boring, yeah. and it's in a city, um, not yeah. much is happening. But you have another structure over here, and there's a there's a river by the side of it. People always yeah. voluntarily just go for that target anyway because it's Hopefully. got a river and yeah. it's nice and it's moving, and there's lots of energy and movement. I know, I know. We we had a practice weekend, yeah. and the day before there was someone missing on Facebook, and so I thought we'd do that. And then I woke up the next morning, and they'd found them, and but I didn't tell the other monitors that they'd found it. And it was amazing how it um, disfigured what they got. And even the monitors who didn't know that the person was found knew there was something wrong. And then we did a, a sort of quick 10 minutes, then we regrouped. And then I said, oh, actually, the person's been found. And we went back and let them view a bit more. So the viewers still didn't know anything about it. And it's like the monitors could be relieved, but they didn't even know that there was anything you know, wrong before, sort of thing. It was so amazing. Yeah. Excellent. Let me see if there's uh, any more questions here. Uh... No, I think we're all right at the moment. Oh, someone else waiting. So many people popping in. Anyone else got anything they want to share or, or talk about or discuss or ask? Going back to numbers, Daz, um, I just wanted to mention that there's a 
a guy called Sean O'Donnell who wrote a book called The Paranormal Explained and he trained himself by use of telephone numbers in one of these big books we used to get yeah. and he Whoa. got good enough for pick three. Now I don't know what happened to him, he might have won a mint and gone into hiding but I've never heard from him since but he might be interested in reading it. He didn't um, use CRV or any of the known methods, he used his own, I guess. Uh, yes, well, what was that again, Glenn? Sorry? Yeah, what, what, what was the name of the book again? Sean O'Donnell? So, Sean O'Donnell, S-E-A-N O'Donnell, and it huh? was called The Paranormal Explained. Okay. I know um, Inga was working um, quite hard on on numerics and numbers. Um, there's a yeah. huge file of, of his research in the uh, University of West Georgia. Uh, I have got a copy of it, but I can't, uh, I can't from life and remember what he did in it, to be honest. It's something I'd have to look, look through it again. Mm -hmm. Do you have any um, like thoughts as to why it's one digit off? Like 22 is 23, 21 is 20. In my experience, I've experienced that too many times to count, and it's it's very frustrating. And, and I think um, a week or two ago, it might have been David or Russell who said um, it almost feels like you're being messed with. Yeah, yeah. It, it feels playful in a way. Yeah, I think that that might have been me. <laughs> I do think that, um, and, and some people don't agree with me on this. I do believe that. Uh, there's a possibility that what's the right word for this uh, your life goals or destiny may be involved and in, in some way and just because you out of greediness might want 20 million in the bank doesn't mean that that's what your life is mapped out for you to achieve um, and also and this is this is a bit of a weird one. Um, there seems uh, there seems to be something within remote viewing, and I don't know how it works. It's just something that we've encountered over years. That it almost and it's, it's strange for me to say this, but it almost feels like it's a it's it's the process of remote viewing itself is its own physical <laughs> living entity type thing that has a trickster type thing about it. But it also has like an it's, it's strange because I, I I've worked huge amounts of group targets now, and what we find is you don't tend to get if you've got like three or five remote viewers working a target, you don't see a lot of times where all remote viewers all describe the same information. And it's just one big clump of information. It seems to it seems to always work out, and when you, you can't work out how, why that if a target's got five, four, say three or four elements, each remote viewer will independently, without no focus on it, just focus on a, a key area with very little overlap with the other people, just enough overlap so you get the data, but there's not a massive overlap of all three doing one bit and then missing the other two areas. It's almost like it's some there's some kind of intelligence there behind it that kind of goes, okay, this target's got three bits, Daz will do this, Edward will do that, Dick will do this, and done. And you know the same with and if you and if I'm trying to make myself a fortune doing lottery, it's almost like this kind of trickster kind of thing. As ah, you know, we're we'll giving we're we'll giving two numbers, and then we'll make the next three numbers go one digit away just to make him think and work like a little bit harder. There seems to be this. Mm. Well, I, I, don't know, I don't know if you've seen um, the Yellow Submarine movie that the Beatles did, the animated one, but the little yellow character that follows them around. That's my personal kind of uh, take on what you just said because I um, I uh, agree completely with you saying like there seems to be kind of like a character involved. It's very strange, and you know, it's it goes against all my not beliefs, but all my logical thinking. But the more I think about it, the more it just doesn't seem to be by chance you know and you know all the people are like they're in the app program there i don't know how many there are on there now glenn are you part of app anymore 
I used to be, but no, not now. But there, there, are, there are like thousands. There's, they've got like thousands of people there, haven't they? Doing, doing. Oh yes. ARV yes. sessions. So you know, and all these people are, you know, and all the people within remote viewing, you've got tens of thousands of people all wanting to, you know, win the lottery, win big with remote viewing. Yeah. Yeah. But it down. I mean, um, and what's the chance yeah. that people don't? Yeah. Uh, I mean. Uh, Oh, sorry. No, go, go ahead, ahead Robin. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, just adding to that, uh, uh, I mean, I've been looking at this with, you know, just uh, numbers and, you know, uh, where there's this uh, one number shifts and, you know, a lot of uh, such crazy things. But then, you know, I've, I've been trying to wrap my head around uh, with uh, the idea of, uh, you know, probabilities as such, right? And there's this beautiful interpretation of uh, quantum mechanics called uh, the transactional interpretation interpretation of quantum mechanics by uh, Andre Kramer, where he says that uh, it, it's very much in tune with uh, what happens in the remote viewing process, where, you know, uh, like any event basically has two kinds of waves, you know, traveling away from it. One is, uh, you know, a future wave, you know, which is, uh, which is already in the future, which is coming back in time. And the other one is, you know, which is traveling from the present moment, uh, you know, going ahead in time. So, uh, uh, that's where you know he discusses uh, uh, like a transaction or a handshake happening between the future waves and the past waves to create you know the present now, right? So I think uh, uh, like uh, there he mentions you know that there's a fair bit of mathematics and uh, science behind it, but he says that you know uh, only uh, the one uh, I mean transactions are going to happen like events uh, uh, are, are, are uh, uh, only those events occur where you know you have a strong advanced wave, like a receiver, like in the future, which again is associated with energy or, you know, like, you know, as, as Ed May, you know, puts up, you know, the, the, the entropy changes and things like that. But uh, on the, uh, like on the more susceptible end, I think it's more to do with, you know, uh, a, a, like a strong uh, advanced wave, which is coming back to us, right? So I think, you know, uh, the feedback sessions that way, you know, make a really, uh, you know, good, uh, effort and you know in, in bringing that thing but otherwise uh, I don't know like I, I think it's it's more to do with probabilistic uh, variations and you know the the strength of the feedback of the target so uh, I mean that's one thing which I've been looking at lately and you know it, it really makes a lot of sense but but I, I don't know how how far I can go with it but yeah yeah Daz, yeah. along the lines of what you were saying uh, when I was training with Ed Danes he told a story I'll never forget. He said that he had come to the conclusion that uh, the matrix had some sort of a filter on it. And the story he told was about an individual who was very good at remote viewing and wanted to raise money to get married, have a family, and had a string of improbable wins. And amassed the money, achieved the goal, got married. But in the process, had gotten kind of addicted to the gambling portion. Yikes. And it started to kick back on his family, his wife, I believe. Uh, Ed had said the, they'd had a baby. And then the guy, in the way Ed put it, whether it's true or not, said he had like a hundred failed bets in a row. He said the, the probability of that guy failing so many times was so unlikely. And so Ed's theory was that, kind of like you were saying, if it's bad for you, it just shut down on him. And apparently he couldn't win a nickel. Mm. Yeah, kind of makes sense. Um, and like, you know, I have no proof for it, other than, you know, I'm, I'm, I try to be all, as honest as, uh, and I've said this story many times, you know, I, knew, I know how I am as a person. And, uh, you know, if I did win, a hundred million on a lottery, I don't think I'd ever work or do anything like this again because I'd be, well, on better days, you know, better lives, we'd be traveling the world kind of thing. Um, and maybe, you know, because this has been such a part of my life, all my life, you know, right from the age of 10 years old, maybe, you know, this is this is what I'm meant to be doing. This, this is my destiny, not what I could be doing if I won 20 million. Oh, yeah. I mean, I've always said to myself, the reason I've never won big money or gotten rich is because if I won 10 million, probably be in the emergency room in about 72 hours. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. And um, yeah, so yeah, it's, it's interesting, you know, because with, with remote viewing, 
I've got such a good accuracy rate over a long period of time that I nail virtually every target. But I bet if I went and tried to do the lottery tomorrow, I wouldn't nail that one. And you have to ask yourself, you know, how can I nail every other target except for the one that would make me, make me stinking rich? It just doesn't make sense, you know. You know, yeah, logically, it just doesn't make sense. Daz, you talk about uh, years ago, you went through a stint where you were, you could not hit target basically for for whatever reason. Was there something that you feel might have preempted that? Did you pull a muscle? I mean, what <laughs> what what do you think happened? I don't know. It was it was quite a few years ago now. It was it was in my early days of CRV training. Um, yeah, so I probably st- I probably like two years in. But literally, yeah, six six months solid, not a single target. And I, back then, I was doing three a week, and I still try to do the same now. You know, I try to do a day on, day off kind of thing, because um, I think RV is like a muscle, and you know, you don't want to continuously every day overtrain your muscles. And so I used to do like Monday, Wednesday, and Friday kind of thing back then. But yeah, every 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 session, three sessions a week for six months, didn't hit a sim, single thing, but just kept coming back and then all is is almost like all of a sudden it just clicked into place and i i generally don't have a i've never had a problem since really i think paul talked to didn't paul talk about this too once russell where he had a stent for a bit where he overworked it or something like that i know paul told me he's never missed a target ever <laughs> <laughs> no um, i i don't remember him saying that um no um, one thing I do, I was going to say, but it looks like Julie left. Um, he told us right in the beginning of basic, he said, if he had to do it all over again, uh, he would, he would not have any kind of cool down ritual process, nothing. He would sit down. And if there was a one man band playing next to him, just sit down, grab the pen and go to work. Um, but Ju- yeah, it looks like Julie's gone. I was going to throw that in. But no, I've never heard Paul talk about a string. Now, I've seen Paul do uh, in his uh, classes. So the four students go away, privately make a target, um, and then give it to whoever his assistant instructor is. And they aren't, they don't know what the target is. So in the first class, um, the four students, we... uh, created target, gave it to uh, Angela Thompson Smith, who then monitored Paul and Paul nailed it. Um, Then in intermediate class, it was uh, Bill Ray, who um, was Paul's assistant, same thing. So I've watched Paul nail two targets that I know he didn't know what they were and the monitor was also blind. So as far as the work I've seen, um now here here's a weird thing uh, this was bizarre so the guy sitting next to me was uh drinking a pomegranate drink and uh paul's in there and he's declaring aols and all of a sudden paul goes pomegranate and then he looks up he goes in 30 whatever years i have never had an aol pomegranate so then the guy next to me called the time out uh, asked if he could talk outside the room to Angela and they went out and talked and he's like, Oh, I ruined Paul's session. Somehow while well, well, that guy was drinking pomegranate beverage, uh, Paul got an AOL pomegranate. So that I found interesting, but the two sessions I've seen him do, he nailed and, um, you know, it, it was really, really interesting to, to watch him work. Great stuff. A question someone's asked here, um, Mike, to everyone. Have remote viewers looked at successful treatments for, I guess, COVID-19 using antibodies from people who developed an immunity or similar? Uh, I I don't know of any. I, there, I guess there might be some out there. Um, I, uh, only what I did in, in the news thing briefly, like I showed earlier, where I had a quick glance at the thought that they might make a, a major development in April uh, outside the US um, but I haven't looked at it uh, in detail and I haven't been tasked it um, I don't know if any of you guys have come across any any remote viewing for it I guess that'd be a no
Uh, I think that's the only question we haven't answered. I'm just looking through them. Yeah, I think so. So anything else from anyone? Or anything to discuss? Yeah. Yep, go ahead. Um, you know, we were talking about something before, um, and it frustrated a lot of people about why sometimes the targets, uh, that, they're, that the outcomes aren't what they were hoping it would be, I mean, aren't accurate. And we talked about, you know, some of us were talking about, do, you know, we jump timelines. Do you think that time is fixed? Is, are these events fixed? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I don't know. I don't think we know enough about time uh, at this stage. It seems pretty malleable. And uh, I think that we as remote viewers, if we look at uh, a target in the future and then put that information out there, I think that people have a possibility to act upon that information and change, change the future in some way. So I think it, it can be changed. Um, I don't know about multiple timelines or anything like that. Uh, I mean, we've all seen instances where that may be a possibility, you know, it's come up in data and Courtney Brown talked about it a lot. I don't know if it's anything's possible at this stage. I think, I, I don't think we know enough about the entire remote viewing process. I do know that Ed, Ed May and all the research they did in the latter stages of the uh, Stargate program, I'd probably say from about 90, to 95 made Ed May and others come to the conclusion that everything to do with remote viewing and clairvoyance and everything is all just precognition. That's, that's, that's what they come out down to, to, to what it is. You know, it's not, it's not separate distinct things. It's just, yeah, it's just us in some way, uh, pre getting data from maybe the feedback or, or, or something from the data. And we're just, you know, getting it from the future, bringing it to the to the past now and reporting it. I don't know. I, as I said, I think I think this whole subject needs huge amounts more research. You know, multi million pounds worth of research over you know five to ten years to to answer some of these questions. I think I think we're at a stage of technology now and science where you know this program was shut down in ninety five. We're now in you know two thousand and twenty. I think we we come so far down the track now with the internet and everything like that supercomputers and all that kind of stuff that we could probably answer some of these questions with a with a really good effort it's just finding someone that will put the money and the effort into place really thanks that's what really interests me about a time in these these targets dads like when when i mentioned before about people getting spotted um i know this has happened to a couple of people at least where they're they're maybe they're spotted in an esoteric target in the past but yet they seem to be noticed by maybe an entity or something in the past yeah. it's it kind of blows your mind as far as what time actually is yeah. i've i've seen i've seen and maybe experienced a couple of examples myself where non-physical entities can do that i haven't but I, in all the thousands of, and i've seen thousands upon thousands of recorded remote viewing sessions now i've never seen i've never seen a, a, an example of a, a, a physical human remote viewer ever uh recording anything like that it's been uh feedback at all but yeah you never right know. it's always an et or something like that yeah it's always it's always yeah it's always with a non-physical et type creature that seems to have that more ability than us. And, you know, if we go along with the, the law and the data that's come out, you know, especially when you talk about the Roswell crash and stuff like that, uh, the data does seem to indicate that everything these uh, beings seem to do does have a uh, non-physical stroke, super psychic kind of component to it. Yeah. David, are you referring to the Mars session with Joe? Well, I was actually, I was referring to a session I think that, that Dick might have had. And then also I had an extended session personally that's always kind of haunted me in a little bit it was Benny and Barney Hill. And I, Ooh. I could swear, you know, on my life that I saw two ETs and they looked like they were looking right at me, you know, mm. and, and it, you know, and it was a target in back in the fifties and it's, I've never not thought about it. It's, it's always been strange to me. Wasn't that a Mars 1 million BC? 
So that was Joe viewing and Skip Atwater being the monitor. When Joe encountered uh, an entity, Skip said, ask him if there's anything you can do to help him in his current predicament, which I found very interesting. If that was a million years ago, and then Joe said that uh, the entity looked at him and thought he was a hallucination. <laughs> so the entity is thinking Joe's a hallucination. Joe's a million years in the past. Somehow Skip's asking, can you help him? I mean, that whole time meld right there it's bizarre. Is, is enough to, yeah, to say, okay, well, we don't know what time is. Yeah. Yeah. Remote viewing is interesting. <laughs> Absolutely. But I, what we do know is that, you know, and I think we, we've all tried this, but pr predictions of the future um, are, no matter what you do, a lot less accurate than predictions of present and especially the past. You know, and in the Stargate unit, they only managed, well, when they did this project, they did a project called Project P, I think they, uh, they only had an eight, a 13 percent accuracy on, on that one. Uh, multi-month project that went on over quite a few remote viewing sessions and you know as with and I've done lots of stuff with crypto viewing recently where we did lots of ARV stuff and I was tasking loads of paid remote viewers um, none of, I don't think any of them are let's have a look, I don't think any of them on the boards here tonight no um, yeah and but some of the projects where we did ARV when we're when we were looking like six seven years into the future very inaccurate data all over the place with with um, displacement, but targets which are looking uh, less than ninety days in the future seem to be a lot more accurate. So that's that's what we're sticking to more than anything now is, is close uh, close proximity predictive stuff because the uh, the other stuff's just just too far out. It gets so noisy, and it's not just single instances. I've recorded, you know, I got loads of these ARV sessions now, and it's just like. The data is all over the place. The far right you go, the, the worse the data is. And I don't know what that means. I really don't know what that means because, you know, does time exist? How does it exist? And why Why? It, why would it be less accurate? Yeah, so it's just something to consider, especially if you guys are doing predictive work. And I do know that there's a, there's a, um, there's a German CRV company out there and I think it's been it's been on some of the forum boards. But they talk about it. They do have a thousand remote viewers working predictive targets on a monthly basis. But then recently, they uh, they hit a wall as well because they couldn't predict uh, with any accuracy past ninety days. It just completely fell apart. And they literally do have a thousand paid remote viewers working for this company in Germany, and, and that's been that's been confirmed to me as well. What about blocking targets, Daz? When you did that Area 51 target initially, I remember you and Courtney in an interview talking about how at first you weren't getting anything, and then supposedly he threw a switch, talked to his buddies, and you know, all of a sudden they, you know, the information was coming through. What did it feel like going through that session where you weren't getting anything? That must have been kind of bizarre, huh? Yeah, I don't know. I, it's, it's, hard, it's hard to know, isn't it, what, what's happening? Because, as I said, we don't know the mechanism of remote viewing, and some of my research does seem to indicate that whatever the task is thinking of or whatever they want might influence what you give them as a reviewer. And uh, if Courtney was thinking in his mind when he sets the targets, oh, I wonder if some blocking systems at Area 51 to stop them getting it, would that be enough to like throw us off? I, we, we just don't know. We don't know enough information on this at this stage. It's all, it's all you know, you just have to say it's all possible. Uh, to be honest, I you know when Courtney says yeah, he talks to these aliens and they unblocked it, all this kind of stuff. Oh, I just don't think about. It. I go yeah, 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 and I just <laughs> just sit down with a paper and just do my do my thing. I don't want to know about anything like that because because you know I'm, I do CRV and it's like no nonsense. It's like yeah. Whereas in my other life, you know, if you ask me in my if my in my kind of circle of where we I used to do circle psychic development work which is all classical stuff then yeah that kind of stuff is prevalent you know you throw up all these energy circles around you these protective circles of white light and all that kind of stuff yeah that's prevalent within that field of technology but it's not it's not within my room it doesn't it just doesn't exist the two don't meet so i don't know on, on the blocking thing i i, 
I, I'm an evidence. Yeah, I, hear you. <laughs> I, I need to see evidence. Yeah. Uh, are there more questions? I don't think there are. There's a good yeah, topic. Yeah, so what, what are your thoughts on deja vu? Like re recently, um, and it's actually kind of like a haunting experience, but recently I had like a Groundhog's Day experience where just no matter what I did, I, I knew every moment of it. And I, I've just, I've spent a lot of time trying to figure out deja vu and I've gotten nowhere. I don't know what it is, but I do get them occasionally, uh, probably about every, I don't know, four or five months. So I'll be, I'll be doing something and it could be different each time. And then you'll think, I'll stop and I'll think, hang on, I've done this, I've done this before. I know exactly what's going to happen. But what, what happens with my days, I don't know if it's the same for everyone, is there's always, you know, only lasts for like, I'd say 10 seconds. And it's always insignificant stuff, but there's always something that's really different in that experience over those 10 seconds than what I remember from the, you know, the instantly gets recalled from the deja vu experience in my head. There's something, yeah, there's always something that's really different that, that marks that out. Um, but I, yeah, I, I don't, I don't know what it is, but I, I, it's almost from my deja vu. I, I think my deja vu comes from dreams. And then when I go through the real experience, it almost gives me a, a quick recall experience in that at some point in a, in a dream somewhere. But as I said, the dream experience is very slightly different for some reason. Mm. But I don't know what it is. I really don't know what it is. Unless, you know, as people think, we do a lot more down downtime in our dreams and stuff. And it's, you know, it's uh, dream stuff that's just been manifested in some way. Do you, do you work in your dreams? No, no. I... <laughs> I, 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 other than remote viewing now, uh, for the last couple of years, well, probably the last four years, I don't do any, anything, uh, anything outside of remote viewing, uh, what, whatsoever, no classical work, no dream work, no nothing. It's just, you know, I spend so much time remote viewing and writing about it and reading about it that, I, yeah, I don't have time to, to look at the other stuff right now. <laughs> no time for a dream journal. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you know, so I'm a bit late. You know, I, I'm a I'm a night owl. So like a, after we finish here tonight, you know, I like, I don't know, we finish after twelve, one o'clock or so. By the time I rendered the video, checked all my bits and pieces, I've gone the tablet for a couple of hours. I won't actually drop off till about three, in three four in the morning. Yeah. So just don't don't have time for everything really. But every every day is like Groundhog Day at the moment. <laughs> Yeah, it's a nightmare. Anyone got anything they want to share then, or any questions or anything? It's about time some of you guys shared some remote viewing. No. Well, we could finish there then, because it's getting on for 12 o'clock, because we've been on for a couple of hours. Wow, that time's gone quickly. Yeah. Thanks, Dads. I guess just one super quick question. Is there a God? <laughs> well, <laughs> I, uh, you did remote view Jesus. I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm, just me I'm just messing with you. Well, from what I've experienced, there seems to be an intelligence behind everything in the universe, but I can't put a physical form or presence to that. It just seems to be, it just seems to be, yeah, it just seems to be so intelligently constructed that it, it's not, you know, it's not accidental. All the things that happen aren't accidental. So there seems to be something there, but I, I have no idea to the structure of it in any way. I don't know of anybody that's tried to remote view God. People have remote viewed Jesus yeah. and got different results. <laughs> I haven't seen anything. I, 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 uh, there was a guy called Aaron Donahue. I think he did Satan once, but I don't know yeah. if I've ever seen anyone do God. Right. I heard. I think I remember that. Yeah. I, don't yeah, know. I think uh, James had people remote viewing the Antichrist and uh, Satan and yeah. stuff like that. It would be an interesting project, I think. Uh, although, you know, feedback would be a, be a hard one, but. 
it would be interesting to see what people got on that. Yeah, definitely. Has anyone tried to remote view a person like a relative who died? I don't know if any of the other guys. Are. I've I've never ever in, my, in the twenty odd years of doing this, I've never done a personal a personal project them that interests me. You know, it's always something that's been given to me. Um, some of this, one of these guys might have done something like that. I know some of the other I, practitioners do practice that you can do that kind of stuff. I actually. Um... I tasked, uh, do you know Gail? Actually, Daz, it is you that um, gave me uh, her contact. I, I tasked her to see, um, my dad passed away in 2017, and um, I wanted to see, you know, whether, you know, you could RV someone who's dead or something like that. So she did a project for me, and um, it was seven days before he died, so we could get some feedback if she's on target and stuff. And then after, you know, what's happened seven days after, after the point of death. So all the RV stuff seven days before he died was spot on. It was amazing. I think it was five viewers, all blind. And um, I've, I've got the actual, um, the report from her. If you, any of you guys want to see it, you can, you can see it. And um, she even got the hospital, they, they even got the hospital steps which led into the hospital, um, his, his tombstone, and the way he used to sit up in bed, it was amazing, really, really good. So that was before he died, but then the part afterwards, that was just, I couldn't make head or tail of it. I mean, it was really, really weird. And um, each viewer got like different stuff, and, um, but a couple of them kept on getting, ah, oh, so you found me, you found me, or something similar to that. But it was really weird. It was like a rebirth as well and all this kind of stuff. So all the stuff beforehand, that was good. But all the stuff afterwards, couldn't make head or tail of it. So. <laughs> you, you did JFK in transition of death, didn't you, Daz? I mean, during his assassination? Uh, yeah, yeah. But I, yeah, that was a kind of, uh, you know, accidentally fell into that one. That was in, um, you know, that was interesting, mind blowing. Actually, that one, one of my favourite ones. But yeah, I, you know, I don't think Courtney want, wanted me to go in in that direction either. Um, but yeah, that was a good one. Can you talk about that? Um, well, it's probably best you uh, watch the video for it because it's on YouTube for free, um, and it's got the live uh, remote viewing there, which captures it a lot a, a lot better, really. Um, but you know, it was a blind target, which turned out to be the JFK assassination. And I knew halfway through the reunion session that it was someone being uh, assassinated and killed. Uh, so I decided just ad hoc in the, in the RV session that to to follow that live form through to see 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 if anything would happen. I don't know why I did it, just to see see what would happen. And I kind of documented this kind of uh, experience of them kind of. Uh, throwing off all the emotions and kind of baggage you get from being a human uh, to go into another state of existence and meeting all these other kind of life forms and that kind of stuff yeah so it's quite in, it's quite interesting um, but yeah it's on it's on YouTube uh, the whole live RV session if, if you want to watch watch that one thanks I'm uh, I'm going to post the link in the chat here in a second. I was just finding the link, so I'll post that in the chat. But as far as that goes, Daz, that's always been my favorite session of yours. Um, There's so many little nuances there that you captured about that exit process that I found just fascinating. But here, let me finish, and I'll, I'll post the link to that uh, video it's really a neat session so yeah it was a good one and you know what what me and dick there created as a uh, as a video was essentially the uh, uh the cutting room floor footage that courtney didn't want to you know didn't want to use and put in his his jfk video because it moved it in a different direction than where he wanted to go so yeah we took the footage from that and independently just put that out and chat that together because we felt it was quite important Okay, yeah, the link is in the uh, uh, chat now. 
Okay, so what do I make of Courtney's recent videos? Okay. Um, I have no comment on what Courtney's doing. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I'm going to say. I love Courtney, he's a great guy, but I have no comment on anything that that comes out of Farsight. That's the best I can say. Yeah, that moon trip is funny. I'm I'm surprised that there is not a a a new video, a new picture of that location. Isn't that an old photograph from an old uh, uh, satellite observer? I Isn't do there? not. I do not know. I I don't even. To be honest, I don't watch the moon. I don't watch. And to be honest, I didn't watch uh, all the video. I didn't watch any hardly any of the videos that I was in. Courtney always sent me a copy of the DVD and I've got them down on a bookcase somewhere and they're still in the shrink wrap because um, I don't like watching myself on video for a start. But I definitely don't watch any of the new ones and I, 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 never, watched, I never watched any of the ones with, with the girls in, you know. The no, I respect. mean the satellite, satellite view of that location. Wasn't there a new, newer satellite going around Mars that takes more uh, better pictures? I, yeah, I, d I don't know. Uh, I did the original uh, project and I saw that he put a new one out and I had a quick glance at it, but as soon as I saw it was the girls and stuff, I just, yeah. it's, not, it's not for me, so I just didn't. He's showing the same picture from the original one, so I thought maybe there was an updated photo that looked at it again, but apparently... I think someone else asked for that on, online, um, but yeah, I have, again, I don't, I don't follow it, so I, uh, yeah, I don't know. Since he got you know, since there was the instant where he was allegedly coaching someone on video, I refused to. Uh... Now, Google Myers, it's a nice picture. I mean, it zooms better than what I have seen otherwise on the internet, but it's, it doesn't look like a water spray to me, so I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't know. It's, it's a, yeah, I, I haven't, I don't know what to say on it. I, I haven't seen it, so I can't really, uh, yeah, discuss it really. That, you know he's doing he's doing his own thing so whatever whatever people feel about it I guess yeah well so you don't go back to hail Bob <laughs> <laughs> yes yes that was some uh, interesting interesting times there so, but you uh, know I did I did some research on that a couple of years ago <laughs> and the whole incident and uh, from the research I did, and I did, and you know, I actually did speak to the Hellbot people and everything, and you know, they they told me that you know he had the stuff that went out on the radio show had no impact in them doing what they were going to do. They already had for years planned, you know, planned to kill themselves anyway. Um, yeah. and they didn't, you know, they said, you know, they just they didn't weren't even on their radar of what Courtney. Put out and stuff. So, so he didn't have any influence on them doing what they were going to do. Um, and I did a little bit of trying, trying to to track down some bits and pieces and stuff. And I got as far, I got a certain, I got as far as I could get before I hit a wall. And but it did, you know, when I, in the research I did, it did kind of indicate, or or I had the feeling that. Um, it wasn't entirely Courtney and Prudence's fault and that they were deceived. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Into all that. Ed was, Ed was supposed to be behind it. There was a lot going on back then, which was a bit, yeah, a bit dodgy, but you know, that was the early, that was the early breakout days of remote viewing. Uh, yeah. and they got caught out, you know, they, they all got caught out, but yeah, I spoke to the Hellbot people and uh, they said, yeah, you know, it had no it had no impact on them making their decision their decision to kill themselves uh and to take their journey they were going to take was wet made years before right. any of that yeah but you know it still negatively uh impacted uh courtney and uh, kind of lingers there ever since excellent then so it's gone midnight here so should we wrap it up for today and uh, maybe meet up next week if we're all still locked in, and I think we will be. Yeah, I'm sorry I got here so late. Yeah, no problem. It's great to have you along. And as I said, we'll do another one next week. Uh, I'll put some on the on the 
Facebook page and you know if anyone wants to do anything on a specific subject or something well we'll see what we can arrange by then okay great if you don't mind my asking Richard are you in the groups yes what, do you mind if I ask your last name Krankowski K-R-A-N oh, okay all right great yeah nice to meet you I've liked a lot of the, the uh, posts you've made thank you all right Dad. thanks again it's awesome we'll see you Friday right yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we might as well. You know, it's it's great to actually see some faces other than my wife in the week. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell her that. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna jump off. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Daz, Russell, all you guys. Thanks, everyone. Thank Have a good, good week, guys. Stay safe. Yeah, thank you. Bye. You too. Take care. Bye, guys.